Hello, my name's Catherine Dixon, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this Climate Group event on energy transition in East Asia. Earlier this year, the IEA set out a roadmap towards a net zero energy system. It described an unprecedented transformation. In the near term, we need the immediate and massive deployment of all available clean and efficient energy technologies. Renewables, of course, have a massive role to play, with global generation from renewables needing to nearly triple by 2030 and growing eightfold by 2050. What this means in practical terms is annual additions of solar and wind power at four times the record level set in 2020 and a massive expansion in clean energy investment to transform our energy infrastructure. Thankfully, the world is not short of capital, but what we do need is to ensure it finds its way to the countries, to the sectors and the projects where it's most needed. One region that should be top of our collective agenda and which looks set to make huge strides in this direction is East Asia. So I'm delighted we have a fantastic lineup of speakers today who are all committed to unlocking an East Asian renewables boom. This will include a panel discussion with representatives from E.ON, from Google, Kepco and Orsted. And I hope they're going to tell us how East Asia can realise its potential to be a global clean energy powerhouse. And we've got an exciting new announcement from the governor of Changnam in South Korea. But first, we're going to turn to hear from Ken O'Flaherty, the, the COP26 regional ambassador who's talking to Alexandra Klassen from Climate Group. Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Alexandra Klassen and at the Climate Group I work with our RE100 member companies, international partners and networks across the world to help open markets to renewables investment from the private sector and specifically in countries which do not have power markets that are streamlined to support voluntary procurement. Today I'm honoured to be joined by the UK government's COP26 regional ambassador Asia Pacific, Ken O'Flaherty. Ken, thank you so much for being here with us. All of us at the Climate Group, and I would like to think all of our speakers in this session, agree with the COP26 presidency that the decisions made today will be vital for laying the foundations for sustainable growth and keeping us within Paris goals. On that note, I'd like to start off by asking you about the COP26 Energy Transition Council, which was launched by the UK government as part of its COP26 presidency. What is it? Uh, how is it set up to accelerate action on clean power? and specifically in Asia, where five countries are investing in 80% of the world's planned new coal-fired power plants. And lastly, what happens to the Council after Glasgow? Great. Well, well thanks again, Alex, for having me today. And the, you're absolutely right. The global energy transition has been one of our key campaigns as COP26 presidency. And we think it's as crucial to be accelerating that transition if the world is going to meet its collective Paris agreements and is to limit um, global warming to 1.5 Celsius. But thankfully, um, economics is on our side. Um, renewables are now cheaper than fossil fuels and coal in the vast majority of countries worldwide, including here in Asia. And the cost of energy storage is also falling every year. And that means that the old arguments around baseload power no longer have the same force as they did before. But we know that many governments worldwide, including um, in this region, need assistance in transitioning to renewable energy. And so the COP26 Energy Transition Council was set up to facilitate that kind of support. It's bringing together um, governments, regulation, regulators, uh, network operators with relevant international institutions who can give technical support and expertise. And it also involves international development banks like the ADB, as well as business experts. And country dialogues under the Energy Transition Council, or ETC, have allowed quite detailed analysis of the challenges in each country. And so that could involve things like reinforcing grids, power networks, markets to manage the more intermittent supply of renewable energy mm -hmm. or to incorporate greater energy storage systems and to help to identify potential solutions. I think we have found that the inclusion of business stakeholders has also allowed us to identify potential obstacles to investment and to advise governments on how to adapt their regulatory frameworks to help new market actors enter. I have to say, I'm also been very excited, I think, in some ways to see increased interest from countries across the region, whether in ASEAN or in South Asia, to greater regional cooperation 
in this area. And so there's real potential now, I think, for countries to integrate their grids to support their energy security, help um, reliability, resilience. And we know, for example, that countries like Nepal have the potential to be exporting hydro and renewable energy to their neighbours. Um, so we've been promoting that kind of proper cooperation as well um, through our engagement. Uh, and you asked about um, what happens after COP26. And I would say we are already committed to continuing the ETC's work into our presidency year. Well, we're working with partners now to develop a programme of work for the ETC in future years so that we can build on the gains which we have achieved so far through closer international cooperation on the energy sector. Great. Thanks a lot for that, Ken. It's, it's good to hear that that work is going to be continued because it's so, so important and that regional co collaboration is going to be absolutely vital. Um, my next question is, is linked to that, but what is really preventing um, cohesive policy frameworks from being developed and adopted to end overseas coal finance? You know, we know that while some East Asian governments have set net zero targets, billions from these countries are still supporting the expansion of fossil fuel projects in Indonesia, Vietnam, and other countries. Um, so can, you know, for example, can public-private partnerships like the proposed uh, ADB-led carbon reduction framework with a host of global financial firms um, that really aims to shut, accelerate the shutting down of Asia's coal fire plants, can that help recalibrate the investment signal? What other things could could really be, um, you know, employed to do this? Well, I, you know, as I said earlier, the context is that renewable energy is cheaper today than mm. coal in the vast majority of countries worldwide and costs are falling. And so in just a few years, it's going to be cheaper uh, in many countries to build new renewables than to run existing coal plants. So it's absolutely right to say that countries which are building new coal plants today are running the risk, or in fact, I would say the certainty of creating stranded assets for the future. Um, so we thought it was great news earlier this year when all G7 countries, including, of course, Japan and South Korea in this region, um, uh, committed to ending or sorry, I mean, Japan, I beg your pardon, uh, committed to ending all international coal financing. And so we're now calling on all other countries um, which are financing international coal to follow suit. Um, and we think that construction of new coal is not in the economic interests of the countries which are concerned uh, and that policymakers have to adapt uh, to the new economic realities of the global economy and be investing instead in the growth sectors like solar and wind energy. But there's the challenge of the coal projects which are already in the pipeline as well yeah. or those which have already been constructed. And we're hearing from many of our partners across Asia that they recognise these will become stranded assets and that they need support in exiting contracts or in decommissioning existing plants early. And so that's definitely an area where cooperation between the public and the private sectors can help generate solutions. And so you mentioned um, the ADB uh, project, and so we very much welcome that, the energy transition mechanism. Both within that, there is the carbon reduction framework around retiring coal assets mm -hmm. and the clean energy fund, which is about investing in repurposing or in new renewable energy assets. And so those are now being piloted um, in Southeast Asia. We very much hope um, they can also be replicated in other relevant markets. And I think this can provide much needed support to countries which want to exit coal and reap the benefits of cheap, clean, renewable energy. And so I'm pretty sure that further such initiatives will be emerging worldwide in coming years, given the very fundamental shift in global markets. Yeah. Thanks for that, Ken. Um, you mentioned Japan, and we know that you know other other markets like South Korea and Taiwan um, in East Asia, despite being um, leading manufacturers of clean te technology products, they really have been historically the lowest users of green energy amongst developed countries. Mm. And um, we know there's a new study by leading Korean research institutes that estimates that South Korea's GDP may contract uh, by up to 3.8% by 2030, uh, 2040, if businesses in um, major export industries do not switch to using renewable electricity. Um, so my question is, do countries risk losing business to other markets if they cannot green their supply chains? Well, absolutely. I think there's probably several <laughs> angles to that. Um, the green tech and the renewable energy sectors will be the growth sectors of the coming decade. Mm. And so countries, businesses which position themselves as leaders in those sectors will gain economic rewards for the future. And conversely, they don't 
um, invest in those sectors will definitely lose competitive advantage. I think we're seeing markets already adapting to that new reality. Um, companies which aren't adopting green energy or which are perceived as dependent on fossil fuels are already turning out to be much less attractive investment opportunities. And I think we'll probably see that trend accelerate um, in coming months and years. I think another phenomenon is, is simply that consumers are paying much more attention to the green credentials of the products that they buy. And so I think it's, it's pretty much inevitable. There will be quite serious economic consequences for industries which are failing um, to shift to renewable energy. And I think there's another challenge perhaps for companies in this area that um, talent uh, is also moving in that direction. Um, the people who um, people want to recruit into sectors um, are, are interested in what companies are doing around their carbon footprint. Companies which are committing to net zero will find it dramatically easier to attract the talented employees they need to thrive in the future. I think. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, it's a really good point that you mentioned on talent there. Um, so uh, you've mentioned, obviously, how economically viable renewables are becoming, um, but we do know that deployment remains really closely tied to supportive policy frameworks that are lacking in you know, over 180 countries. We know from RE100 members um, that there are many, many markets where they still cannot purchase renewables, um, or it's very, mm. very difficult and expensive to do so. Mm. And on the panel today, we'll be discussing what governments in the region need to do to unlock kind of large mm. untapped sources of capital, um, both for the demand side and supply side. So from your perspective as COP26 um, regional ambassador for Asia Pacific, what can businesses do to turn up the pressure on governments to act quickly? And then um, on the other hand as well, we'd like to know what role can sub-national Asian governments and cities play in setting that mm -hmm. leadership bar to accelerate the energy transition? Sure. Well, maybe starting starting then with the businesses. I'd, I, I always say businesses have a key role in, in driving climate action. And I think that is particularly true in Asia. Um, we've seen for decades strong growth in Asia, and a lot of that has been based on very close partnerships between governments and with business. So if businesses tell governments it's crucial for their future profits for them to have access to renewable energy, then I think governments will listen. And that can obviously um, vary according to the nature of individual companies' relationships with government. So in the case of major conglomerates, um, perhaps they would have direct contact with smaller businesses, uh, perhaps through business confederations. Um, but we know there are many ways in which businesses um, can communicate their views to government um, within the Asian region. In the UK, our Confederation of Business uh, British uh, Industry, uh, the CBI, has consistently played a very strong role in pressing for action on climate change and decarbonisation of our economy. And I think that partnership between government and the CBI in the UK um, is also reflected in the fact that we have gone further in recent years um, than indeed any other G7 partner mm -hmm. to decarbonize our economy, but we've also recorded the highest level of growth. So there's no long, no real um, trade-off between action on climate change and growth in, in the economy. I think within my role, I've seen some examples of how businesses can play um, quite a strong role in, in this sector. And a good example perhaps is Cambodia, uh, where we saw international garment makers right to the government of Cambodia saying it was essential for them um, to have access to garments which were produced using renewable energy. Um, that was reflecting the consumer pressures I mentioned earlier, and it was taken very seriously by the government. And I think it did have a real impact on policy making there. So I'm sure that similar approaches uh, by companies based in East Asia would have similarly powerful um, results. Mm. And of course, I would have to mention that companies themselves can drive change. Um, they can, for example, join the Race to Zero um, campaign. They can um, take measures such as moving their car fleets to electric vehicles. They can be investing in energy efficient products. They can be looking at um, the um, sourcing of the products which they are buying as components in industry, making sure those are from sustainable um, sources. And so there, there's really things that companies can do individually, quite apart um, from government policy, um, which uh, can, can make a difference in this sector. Um, and I think we've been quite pleased uh, within uh, Asia to see so many companies join the Race to Zero already. And I really would take this opportunity to encourage um, companies and businesses to consider um, joining and helping us to accelerate that in the months ahead. 
Right. And I think you also asked about subnational governments. I think we think um, that they and also cities have a very important role in helping to accelerate um, the energy transition. Um, they can set up local policies which are supporting investment in renewable energy or which are supporting um, the phase out of coal. And they can also campaign. So, so you may have heard of the Powering Past Coal Alliance, which aims um, to accelerate fossil fuel phase out of coal fired power stations. And just this week, four uh, South Korean provinces, um, which together uh, represent about 80% of the country's coal capacity, called on the South Korean government um, to follow suit. And of course, we're seeing um, other cities and regions across um, Asia um, similarly advocate strongly. I think that reflects um, climate awareness, obviously, but it also reflects their economic self-interest. Um, the cities and the regions which invest today in renewable energy will be reaping rewards in terms of growth and jobs for the future. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Ken. Yeah, we were really, uh, really, really excited to see that announcement um, by the South Korean provinces. Um, thank you so much for being with us today and for sharing your, your insights. And we really look forward to, to Glasgow. Thank you very much. Now let's turn to our panel. Uh, so talking us through the transition in East Asia, we have uh, Kahori Miyaki, the Chief Sustainability Officer of E.ON and the co-chairwoman of Japan's Climate Leadership Partnership. We also have Leo Wirowan, who is leading on energy strategy and global infrastructure at Google. We have Yang Sung Ho, the Assistant Vice President and the Head of Energy Strategy Team at Ketco and Matthias Bausenwein, the president of Allstead in Asia Pacific. So let me start with you, uh, Kahori. Can you tell us uh, what role business has played um, in Japan in influencing the direction of the power market? How's the process worked? Thank you, Catherine. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. I'm Kahori Miyake, Chief Sustainability Officer of E.ON, which is a Japanese retail conglomerate. And I also co-chair Japan Climate Leaders Partnership, a coalition of 193 companies that aim to create a zero carbon society. Our electricity demand together amounts to 61.4 terawatts, representing approximately 7% of the electricity demand in the industries in Japan. I think our voices from the business side, especially from those companies who are within the global supply chain made a big difference. The message that we need to be net zero carbon if we wanted to stay in business. Japan cannot be globally competitive unless the country starts moving to that direction was a very strong message. It was not just about the environment. It was about keeping the company and businesses alive. It was about competing within the global economy. I think that was a strong wake up call to our policymakers. Another important perspective was that we raised our voices from the demand side of the energy. E.ON is a retailer and not exactly embedded inside a global supply chain. However, we as a whole group use a very large amount of electricity, especially at our retail stores. We wanted to send a clear message to the market and to the utilities that there is a strong demand and need for a renewable energy. As I said, JCLB companies represents approximately 77% of the electricity demand in Japan. I think it was a big enough voices to be heard. So yes, I do think that it is important to voice our needs from the demand side rather than policymakers and power markets telling us what is possible and what they can offer us. Great, that's uh, fantastic, Kahori, and I think really shows the power of business in influencing government. So that's a great segue to you, Leo. So, um, you know, Google's obviously been very big in this space, and I'd, I'd love to hear a bit more about why Google's moving towards this 24-7 carbon-free energy. What's your thinking behind that? And if you could tell us a bit about what you see, you know, is the potential in East Asia, what needs to be done? We are a large energy user, uh, and as the demand for the Google services grown, so to our consumptions. In 2019, uh, we have uh, used roughly 12 terawatt hours uh, globally. We hit our 100% renewable energy goal in 2017 uh, and has done it again, even as our consumption grow on 20% year on year basis in the last few years. 
Globally, we own and operate 23 data centers in four continents. In the Asia Pacific region, we represent in um, Singapore and Taiwan. And also in 2019, Google acquired land at Chiba New Town, Japan for our future data centers. The first thing we look at all of our fleet of data center is energy efficiencies. And for more than a decade, we have worked to make Google data centers some of the most efficient data centers around the world. Let's take a look of the energy journey for, for Google. We started in 27 by going carbon neutral. Uh, and this is setting the standard that many companies have since adopted to address the operational emissions. A decade later, 2017, we took another leap and becoming the first major company to match 100% of our annual electricity consumption with the renewable sources. Moving forward, building on what we have learned and helped to create, we are excited that we are embarking on the final and most ambitious phase of our energy journey. That is by 2030, we intend to run on carbon-free energy everywhere at all times. How does 24-7 carbon-free energy differ from the 100% renewable energy? Basically, it's filling all the renewable energy by the hours and make sure that we have the sources of renewable energy and carbon-free energy at all hours that we have. In East Asia, and actually also around the world, we plan to achieve the 24-7 carbon-free energy using basically three strategies. The first one is purchase multiple types of renewables in more regions. Uh, number two, drive progress in next generation technologies both also on the existing renewables, but also on the future technologies. And number three, work with partners to advocate for smart public policies. Thank you very much, Catherine. Great, thanks. So, I mean, what Google's doing here is going to, um, you know, put some pressure on those that are responsible for, for energy supply. So I'd like to um, turn now to, to you, Yang. Um, South Korea is an exciting uh, place to be right now. Could you tell us what changes are happening in the Korean energy market and, and what KEPCO, what KEPCO's strategy is furthering this, please. Yeah, thank you, Kesari. Yeah, recently, the Korean government has put a policy direction toward a carbon neutral society by uh, 2050. Last October, the government declared the 2050 carbon neutral strategy. In August, the parliament passed the carbon neutral framework uh, framework Act, which calls for a minimum of 35% uh, carbon emission reduction by 2030. Under these uh, policy directions, CACO has been implementing uh, detailed action plans to uphold the national commitment toward the low carbon energy system. Uh, first, CACO is facing our coal power generation and expanding renewable energy with uh, aggressive rebalancing energy mix approach. Our second, CACO is investing in grid infrastructure to integrate increasing uh, renewable energies into the grid and enhance uh, grid stability. Finally, we are uh, trying to improve energy efficiency in energy use. Yeah, carbon neutrality is uh, our future and also global mission. Yeah, we can avoid it. Uh, you know, the Korean government released the three carbon neutral scenario last month. Uh, the most important thing for CACO, yeah, as a, a great company, yeah, we uh, integrated uh, renewable energy and uh, operate grid stably. So we need to reinforce and operate the grid system as a carbon neutral scenario and NDC confirmation. Yeah, we prepare and make a new plan for next grid system. Also, it's a task for our society uh, to think about the, uh, the increasing cost and how to optimize the uh, cost in the near future. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, and now turning to, 
to you, Matthias. Um, I know quite a bit about what uh, Allstead's been up to in uh, a different part of the globe, but can you can you tell me what you're doing in this region? What you know, what opportunity do you see there? Um, thank you. Um, first of all, uh, a few words about Allstead. We are renewable major. We are the global market leader in offshore wind. Uh, we develop, build, and operate offshore wind power plants. And um, besides that, we also do onshore wind, hydrogen storage, biomass everything which makes us a very green uh, company. And um, in APEC, we are now present across four strategic markets, Korea, Japan, Taiwan, uh, Vietnam. We're also present in Malaysia, Singapore. Um, we've been here for a couple of years. And if you ask why we are here, then um, of course, uh, the APEC region per se is, uh, is, is growing. Uh, economic growth is very evident and we see a lot of energy demand connected to that. And that demand should be met by renewable energy, of course. Uh, we are a pioneer here. We have implemented some um, first uh, projects, for example, in Taiwan over the past couple of years. And we want to bring more of that to the region. Uh, if you look a bit back, uh, we have roughly seven years ago made a strategic decision to go global from a more northwestern European utility, state owned, um, majority state owned still uh, by the state of Denmark, by the way becoming global, going first to North America, where we have opened up our Boston office. And now we have a really strong presence across offshore and onshore wind and PV, et cetera, in the US. Uh, and uh, then just a few months later, we opened up the first office, uh, which is also our hub in Taipei. And we have since then uh, built up um, a, a track record um, in the region. Um, yeah, I think uh, the region very much needs experience from Europe, but um, we also need to uh, learn every market is very different. We, we need to help um, our partners to become successful. Um, and we also want to build up a strong uh, local industry. And we need that uh, strong industry in APEC to also bring it global again. Great. Thank you very much uh, for that. So I think, you know, diving in a bit more detail then, um, Maybe back to you, Kahori. I, I think you know if there was ever a, a really good case study of how business can influence government, I think you set you set it out for us. And I wonder whether there are any lessons uh, that you might draw from this, or advice that you would give, you know, to others who were trying to you know work together as business to influence government policy. You know, how did you go about it, and you know what could others learn from your experience? Thank you, Catherine. Um, it, it is a long journey. Um, we, uh, as a coalition, have been working on this for uh, uh, quite a few years. Um, um, but it, it has been recently that the, the whole process has moved, as you know. Um, since I joined, uh, I part, you know, I, I saw COP23, was it, in 20. 2017, four or five years ago, and at that time, the government was, well, no, there's no way we can give up coal, mine, coal um, uh, plant. And today, they say they're going to uh, finish that. So it, it, we can, um, you just have to be very persistent. Um, and we are actually the one who using the electricity. So um, make that point, and also it's a global uh, economy. Japan is not does not stand alone. Um, it's part of the global economy, and you have to keep pressing that to to the uh, people. And um, of course, it, it also makes a big difference whether you have the technology, the the solar panel, and everything, and the wind power. Um, those technology has improved so much in this past few years that people started to think, "Oh, okay, it might be possible, you know, to do that." Then five years, you know, ago or six years ago, so. Um, I think it's it's very important that you, you be very persistent about what you want from the demand side. Great, thanks. Uh, so some good lessons there. I see you nodding there, Leo. Maybe you could also come in on this point and, and perhaps articulate a bit. I mean, Matthias touched on it slightly. You know, what are the real sort of barriers do you think that you see in the region for, because getting to 24 seven, you know, is pretty ambitious. Uh, you know, what, what will hold the region back or what would you like to see policymakers focusing on? 
Thank you very much, Catherine. Maybe I I will continue from from Kaori uh, uh, about uh, some case study that that we have seen uh, and and how and hopefully this this illustrate on on some of the things that that can can make it uh, happen on on some of these ambitions that we have. Um, let's start from Taiwan. Uh, at the end of 2018, we signed a long term purchase agreement. Uh, for a 10 megawatt solar array uh, for a larger solar farm in Tainan City, Taiwan. Uh, this is located roughly 100 kilometers of our Changhua data center uh, and connected to the same regional grid. The most important in here is that the deal was made possible after the discussions between Google industry stakeholders and the Taiwanese government, uh, which amended the country electricity act to allow the non-utilities companies to directly buy renewable energy and decrease their carbon footprint. So this is an important step, an important milestone uh, towards further things. Uh, and since then, we have, we have seen uh, quite a few others uh, corporate power purchase agreements being enacted in Taiwan. The second example that, that, that we can get is uh, from, from Singapore. So, in early 2020, we signed an agreement with both uh, Semcorp Power and Semcorp Solar to purchase surplus energy from the public housing projects with the rooftop solar installations. This purchase represents Google's first renewable energy in Singapore, um, and this is directly integrated with our existing power supply. The source coming from roughly 500 public housing flats with the rooftop installations. Equally important, we hope that this type of deal is the first step towards making renewable energy more widely accessible to all energy users globally and also locally. So I think with, with those two examples, we see that uh, uh, the ecosystem working together can create the change that needed that that we have been wanting to see great thank you well i think you know just particularly picking up on the first example um i wonder young if i can turn to you i mean you outlined you know the very complex uh set of challenges that that you know that kepco is is working on i wonder if specifically you could tell us how kepco feels about the you know potential ability for companies to do direct PPAs and you know for corporate sourcing of, of renewable electricity in Korea. Um, I wonder if you could you know sort of give us a sense of where Korea's thinking is on this. Yeah, companies could buy a renewable electricity directly from uh, producers in the near future. Yeah, uh, Kepco hopes that renewable uh, energy use could boom up uh, through direct PPA thus leading to lower energy cost. Uh, since uh, PPA is different from the uh, from conventional electricity trading system, uh, CACO need to review new aspects technically and systematically. Uh, in technical aspect, a firm connection between the PPA parties is required. Shortage or uh, surplus of power from the parties may affect the whole power system. Uh, creating an imbalance between supply and demand. Uh, therefore, uh, CACO should be prepared for such contingencies in systematic uh, aspect of market system to promote PPA should be designed. Uh, while other retail customers and PPA parties share their systematic uh, cost reasonably and fairly, uh, CACO is ready to uh, cooperate with all participants, the PPA and the retail customers, and the government to uh, create a system that everyone is satisfied. satisfied. Yeah, consumers' demand for renewable energy could lead to an in, uh, investment incentive for supplies in the right of this. Uh, PPAs could contribute to scale up renewable energy while facilitating energy trade between producers and uh, consumers. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, um, Yang. I think this is really um, exciting news, you know, that you are 
um, moving in this direction. And clearly, you know, the challenges for a system operator are, you know, not to be underestimated, but it seems like there's lots of experience um, you know, in your region of, of trying to do this that, you know, Google just outlined. So, um, you know, we wish you a, a lot of success with that. Um, Matthias, just sort of building on this, what, um, you know, companies need from, from governments. You know, we've obviously heard, heard from the, the, um, the corporate sourcing side, but there was a hint in, in what you said earlier about the challenge between this, you know, the, the sort of East Asian you know, history of supporting kind of national champions in in industries and, you know, the, the pace at which, you know, we need to build out energy infrastructure in Asia. And I wonder whether, you know, you know, how what does Orsted really need um, in the region to go at the fastest pace that you could? Yeah, um, first of all, we can definitely say that uh, things are moving and uh, while they are moving, uh, we see a lot of uh, progress. Um, they can always be better, um, right? We definitely still need to step up in many of the markets I just mentioned before and the countries to bring more and more renewable energy into the mainstream. Um, we have seen some good top-down targets. Many countries have now um, committed to net zero and carbon neutrality. And we see when we take offshore wind as an example, clear top-down targets like Japan, 10 gigawatt by 2030, or Korea, 12 gigawatt by 2030, Taiwan adding another 15 uh, gigawatt by 2035. So that is really good. But uh, I think what is really crucial now in this, um, after this first phase is about uh, caring about how to deliver. And we see uh, a lot of still obstacles and um, limitations in terms of like delivering really on these high ambitions. Um, that's hands-on experience we make in the markets. Uh, we need to remove all these obstacles and think big. Uh, that could be, um, for example, um, let me give you an example. In Taiwan, the new framework just outlines a cap of 500 megawatt for projects, while we are at the moment building 900 megawatt projects already. Uh, that is limit, limit, limiting the, the size of projects and, and, and um, doesn't allow for scale. Scale which is urgently needed to bring the cost down. And the cost needs to come down also for all across all renewable energy still in order to uh, be fully accepted. So that's just one example. So this trade-off between energy and industry policy is another example where we still try to, of course, build up a lot of uh, uh, local suppliers to also participate in that. But sometimes uh, the ambition to bring a lot of local content into the project is, of course, a bit too high and therefore then slows down the renewable build out and that we can actually not afford. I would say uh, to the governments all across, they shouldn't worry too much because the market is so big and it's picking up so fast that there will be naturally a lot of business in the home markets for all these um, uh, suppliers who are interested in investing, while we will also see a lot of export opportunities for the first movers and pioneers. So um, that is really uh, um, something we have seen in Europe and we will see that equally in Asia Pacific, who is daring to invest and willing to move uh, as a pioneer will also get a lot of reward in terms of growth and, um, and, and participating from, from these benefits renewable energy brings also from an industrial perspective. And, and back and maybe closing the circle, um, I think uh, we need uh, to have the business step up. Google is a great example. There's also other great examples. As you know, we have signed the uh, world largest corporate PPA in Taiwan with TSMC, uh, the chip maker. And um, that is, of course, extremely nice and great. But in order to also roll it out in the future rounds, we still need improvements uh, on, the on the on the regulatory side because um, um, as the frameworks very very often look like now in Taiwan in but also in, in other markets it's simply not possible to provide direct access to all the uh, business who wants to uh, be provided with with green electricity and uh, the same for hydrogen now is I think or, or any uh, green fuels we need to now um, um, somehow implement some initial uh, framework or subsidies for, for, for such a new technology in order to really kickstart it large scale. But it's it's a good start there, but it needs a bit of um, a push. Great, thank you. So, well, that, that's a very compelling case for, uh, um, you know, for maybe a, a, a slightly different approach to industrial strategy than perhaps has been common in the region. And I wonder, Kahori, whether you could, you know, with your experience, give us a bit of a sense of, 
you know, how things feel in Japan. I mean, it's in, some incredibly ambitious transformations that will need to happen in the in the Japanese energy system. You know, do you think, uh, you know, the economy is ready to, um, you know, to put those ambitions ahead of perhaps what might be a more traditional approach to the development of, of, of industry? Um, thank you. Um, I, I totally agree with what Matthias was just was said. Um, you need a push, um, and in Japan as well. The target is there. The the you know, Prime Minister Suga was brave enough to make that bold target, but the target itself does not you know, happen if unless people you know start deliver. And I, I think there's a couple of things. Um, one thing is that. Um, you have to see at the financial market, you know, the financial market is ready to invest. There's so many um, ESG, uh, there's talk about how this money is flowing into uh, uh, this field and we have to uh, benefit from that and utilize that money, uh, financial uh, financials um, in, in pushing this, this um, uh, process. So that's one thing I'm very ha um, positive uh, about it. And uh, um, um, ha I think it, it will work. Um, um, opportunity, you know, it, it's a great opportunity. Um, the other thing is um, we talked about a little bit of regulations um, and in Japan, it's the same way in any other, any countries, but we have this uh, old system that worked before, fine, but we have to change that um, regulations um, in order to make, build, a, a, a transform the, the whole society. Um, the grid system it has to be changed. And especially in Japan, it, it comes a little bit uh, difficult because we have established such a, a perfect grid system and the, an energy system in the society, and it was fine. It was working fine. So people are very reluctant, I'm sure, um, to change this whole system, but we have to change this to fit the um, uh, zero carbon society. Uh, the grid has to be redone. Uh, we has to move off from the centralized grid system to a more localized and decentralized uh, um, system. And that needs a lot of investment in, in, in itself. But um, we know how to do it. it it's just about um, you really do it and um, the in the amount of, um, there might be some pain um, in, in the process, but I think um, right now the government, the industry, uh, with, and also the consumers, the, the people who actually living uh, their daily life, they might have to change a little bit, but everybody has to um, understand that there is a way possible uh, to solve this. So um, I, I think um, Japan, if you ask me if we are ready at today, maybe not, but we're very close to um, getting ready. And I think the process will actually start um, soon. Great, thank you, Kahori. That's, uh, yeah, really interesting insights into Japan. And I wonder if Leo, you might be able to expand a little bit, you know, regionally, you know, what do you, do, do you see the potential for governments to move fast here and to really start you know, shifting regulation, allowing more outside players in, liberalizing, decentralizing, as Kahori said, or, you know, what do you think the political challenges are here? Yeah, I think um, when, when we talk about about uh, East Asia, whether that's a Northeast Asia, Southeast Asia, we are we are comprised of many different countries with many different systems and uh, many different electricity markets, really. So I think uh, it's a bit, uh, I think that, that all the markets uh, is at the different stage uh, of, of, of the electricity. But I think one common thread that we can say in here is that uh, public policy is uh, essential, right, to accelerating the de decarbonization. I think this is this is the this is the one that that we that we would like to advocate. Um, there's a few few examples uh, that we can have, for example, uh, number one, competitive wholesale electricity market. I think this is uh, essential to drive down the cost of, of energy. I think that's 
that is something that 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 that, that, that we we see also getting uh, more and more prevalent but uh, we also hope to see more um, policies and investment to develop and commercial advanced energy technologies i think um, there, there has been a lot of uh, emphasis on uh, for example wind and solar but also if we if we move uh, into into the future i think the technology inclusiveness uh, needs to be expanded in order for for uh, our decarbonization to move fast um, and i think last but not least uh, is a cost effective consumer access to clean energy i think this one has been mentioned by by a few speakers uh, i think definitely in order to promote uh, it has to be a cost effective and consumer focused energy that we have great thanks I think we're going to sort of turn towards beginning to wrap up here, but I, I want to uh, ask you when you uh, maybe give your closing suggestions for how we we realise the potential, if you might uh, give a thought to any suggestions that you've got for others on the panel, you know, hearing, you know, the, the challenges that you're each facing and, and your approaches, you know, areas where, you know, there might be potential to work together, because I think from listening to the stories that you've each told, you know, it feels like there's a there's a an opportunity for, for collaboration here. So, Matthias, maybe I can turn to you first. And, you know, if you can give us, you've you know heard from the others on the panel, any reflections on you know what you think the real focus needs to be in East Asia, and, and you know, and opportunities uh, you see for the others to have impact. Yeah, I mean, um, I think we we see there's a lot of need for action. I, I I've heard a lot of good comments. Um, I mean, I'm pointing to Japan. I I think what the JCLP, JCLP is doing is is really great, and I encourage them to. To do more of that uh, i don't know i read a paper on the carbon pricing in japan i think that's a direction which makes good sense and should further be pushed there is other uh, debates ongoing um but i think we need to continue to work hand in hand and and push further um i think when you look at the stakes we have climate uh, uh, we have the latest ipcc report which has really shown us how bad the consequences can be if we're not acting now we need to really um, avoid um, um, staying on a road we are still on we're not we're not good enough politically we need to um, even there's net zero commitments and decarbonization commitments do way more that goes from uh, um, putting even higher targets up but also as i said before um, really streamlining processes and planning um, uh, um, really from very strategic to very operational um, and I really encourage the business to further uh, um, um, demand, uh, also not only uh, as uh, on the demand side per se, but also let me take our example. We also need to um, ask for a very green supply chain. Uh, that, that's another example. So it's 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 about um, also forcing our supply chain to become green. We have. Uh, out of our, we have roughly 28 very strategic suppliers, and 26 of them have now already committed to also follow us, follow us on our completely green uh, transition journey. And um, that's also something which I would encourage uh, fellow companies here um, to 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 go for. Um, yeah, other than that, I think um, I'm very keen and open to further collaborate um, as we do already in in some in some areas and uh, continue the good dialogue with all my uh, fellow colleagues here. Uh, so, Mr. Yang, um, I wonder if you could give us any final thoughts on, you know, what KEPCO's strategy um, for achieving the, the, you know, the transformation that you set out earlier. Oh my God, uh, okay, yeah, yeah, okay. According to the government's forecast, yeah, electricity demand by uh, 2050, yeah, yeah. Uh, would grow more than the twice than current level uh, due to the electrification from other sectors such as in uh, transportation and buildings uh, due to expansion of the distributed energy resource and intermittent uh, renewable generation CACO as a uh, Korea's grid operator is starting an optimal grid operation yeah. accordingly CACO will continue to reinforce grid connectivity and upgrade its 
operational skills for for energy sources integration. Yeah, for example, yeah, solar and wind farms are booming, uh, especially in southern and eastern region in Korea. Uh, some of which are waiting for grid connection. Uh, thus, uh, expanding and reinforcing grid infrastructure in these regions would facilitate the re renewable energy integration in short term. Another example is installing ESS yeah, for quick response to variable renewable generation, yeah, which would improve reliability of power system and support grid stability. Yeah, you know, the, in this regard, uh, electricity grid would play a role like a backbone in carbon neutral power system by transporting distributed energy generation uh, to end users. Thank you. Thank you, Yang. Um, Leo, um, over to you then. Any sort of final thoughts or suggestions for other panelists? Yeah, I think um, certainly there is there's a lot of scope for cooperations, right? I mean, between the utilities, uh, 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 re renewable developers, uh, corporates, uh, and even regulators. I mean, there there's a lot uh, of, of discussions. Um, I probably just uh, one, um, I think to, for example, to achieve uh, in, in our goal to, to have this 24 seven carbon free electricity, uh, one, one of the strategy we'll need is to purchase a mix of different clean energy sources. Uh, to, and this is required that, so that we can better match the electricity demand with the supply. Um, so I think in this, we typically approach by signing the power purchase agreement for individual projects. So what what we have been piloting in, in in a few a few sites that we have globally is to have an agreement where we work together to optimize the portfolio of the clean energy, and 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 use that agreement to then uh, put into one integrated solution. So this is I think one one of the examples where uh, there is a contribution from various parties and how to make this happen together. Great, thanks, Leo. And I, Kahori, I give the final word to you. Um, your final thoughts and any, you know, areas where you see potential, you know, for others to, to, to help push in the same direction. Yes, thank you. Um, I think in addition to what everybody already um, mentioned, I think I, I would want to because we are retailer i am from a retailing company and i want to stress and um, point out that that we have to include our our uh, consumers each and every person um because it's not only the big companies that who uses electricity it's not only the big corporations that needs green energy it, it's a, it's about the whole society <clears throat> and everybody else so um what we are trying in japan well especially in japan is that we need to include these individuals um, individual consumers so that they would be part of it and they would also want to demand a green, greener uh, society and i think that's uh, it's a very important part of the whole piece and um we as a retailer who has everyday contact with the consumers, I think it's our mission, it's one of our missions to include them in the dialogue and the conversation. And um, I think it goes with everybody, you know, it's the same way in any Asian countries as well. Um, their life has to be better as well. So um, I think that's uh, one thing that we don't know how to yet, but um, we have to keep working on, on, on this one, this part uh, as well. Great, thank you, Kahori. Well, I, I just wanna close really by saying, you know, a really warm thank you to, to all of you. I think you're doing such incredible work and are really, you know, in, in your different ways, you're at the front line of the, of the energy transition. Um, so, you know, I, I, I wish you sort of every success in, in what you're, 
you're pushing for. I think the panel has illustrated to me the power that business has to work with government uh, to make this transition a reality. Um, so thank you very much to everyone. Um, we're now going to um, turn to an announcement from the governor of uh, Cheongnam in South Korea. So the South Korean province of Cheongnam has shown um, immense leadership in the fight against climate change. Uh, they were the first Asian member of the Powering Past Coal Alliance. They were the first South Korean member of the Under Two Coalition. And they have also set 2050 net zero targets. So Governor Yang is also the Asia Pacific co-chair of the Under Two Coalition, and he hosted the annual coal phase out and proactive response to climate change conference earlier this month. And this, of course, highlighted the need for coal phase out and the importance for states and regions uh, to set net zero targets. So now over to you, Governor Yang. Yorobun, 아울러 2021 뉴욕 기후 주간에 함께하는 세계 각국 및 지방 정부, 기업, 단체 회장님께도 존경과 감사의 마음 담아 인사드립니다. 존경하는 내기빈 여러분. 제가 있는 이곳 대한민국 충청남도는 수년 전부터 기후 위기에 대한 심각성과 위협을 인식하고 적극적으로 대처해 왔습니다. 이유는 이렇습니다. 충남은 대한민국의 국토 중앙에 있는 지방 정부입니다. 교통의 요지이면서 철강, 디스플레이, 석유, 화학, 반도체 등 첨단 산업의 중심지로서 국가 경제를 이끌어가는 곳입니다. 반면에 수많은 산업 시설과 가까운 수도권 전력 공급을 위해 전국 화력 발전소의 절반인 28개가 모여 있어 대한민국에서 가장 많은 양의 온실가스를 배출하는 지역이기도 합니다. 충청남도가 기후변화 위기에 앞장설 수밖에 없었던 이유가 바로 이 때문입니다. 2017년부터 매해 탈석탄 기후위기 대응 국제 컨퍼런스를 개최하고 2018년에는 대한민국 지방정부 최초로 언더투 연합에 가입하는 한편 아시아 지방정부 최초로 탈석탄 동맹에 가입하는 등 국내의 정부들과의 공조를 강화해 왔습니다. 또한 지난해에는 국내 최초의 탈석탄 금고 선언으로 금융기관의 탈석탄 참여 여부와 친환경 에너지 투자 실적 등을 반영하는 평가 지표를 도입하여 금융기관의 재생 에너지 투자 확대를 이끌었습니다. 이와 함께 대교육의 주요 원인 중 하나인 노후 석탄 화력 발전소 2기를 국가 계획보다 2년 앞당겨 폐쇄하고 이를 통해 연간 600만 톤의 온실가스를 줄이는 성과도 이뤄냈습니다. 말 그대로 지방 정부가 국가의 기후 위기 대응을 선도해 온 것입니다. 지난 9월 8일에는 탄소 중립 그리고 정의로운 전환을 주제로 다섯 번째 기후위기 대응 국제 컨퍼런스가 열렸습니다. 이번 컨퍼런스에서는 언더투 연합 아시아 태평양 지역 포럼도 최초로 개최하며 세계 각국의 탄소 중립을 위한 논의장이 마련되었습니다. 그러나 이런 충남의 노력에도 불구하고 아직 해결되지 않은 수많은 과제들이 남아 있습니다. 탄소 중립의 대전환 시대에 일자리 문제, 경제 문제는 공정하고 정의로운 전환은 아직 분명하게 제시되지 않고 있으며 탄소 포직과 신재생 에너지 전환 기술 개발, 도입 비용 등은 지방 정부 스스로 감당하기에는 분명 어려운 부분입니다. 특히 환경 문제 해결을 위한 신기술 도입에는 
이 국가의 공존보도 자국의 경제적 논리를 우선하는 경우가 많기 때문에 박사는 버려지고 이로 인해 지구의 생명은 더욱 짧아지고 있습니다. 때문에 향후 각국 정부와 지방정부, 기업, 단체가 어떻게 협력하는가에 따라 지구의 미래가 결정된다 해도 과언이 아닐 것입니다. 이 같은 중요한 시점에서 우리는 단소중립이라는 명확하고 확교한 묘표 아래 국권이 협력하고 아낌없이 지원해야 합니다. 충청남도 또한 지금껏 노력해왔듯이 전 세계 기후환경 위기에 작지만 큰 발걸음으로 함께 대응해 나가겠습니다. 존경하는 내기민 여러분, 현재는 불확실성에서 확실성을 찾아야는 어려운 상황입니다. 하지만 인류의 지혜를 모아 지금의 위기를 슬기롭게 헤쳐나간다면 2050 탄소주의 비전이 결코 비현실적인 목표가 아닐 것입니다. 다음 세대에 안전하고 깨끗한 죽을 물려줄 수 있도록 앞으로도 함께 힘을 모으길 기대합니다. 아울러 뉴욕 기후 주관에서 논의되는 다양한 내용들이 각국의 정부와 기관, 기업의 기후위기 대응에 선명한 이정표가 될 것이라 믿어 의심치 않습니다. 다시 한번 2021 뉴욕 기후 주관 개최를 진심으로 축하드리며 탄소 중립을 향한 적극적인 움직임이 제26차 유엔 기후변화 협약 당사국 총회까지 이어지기를 바랍니다. 감사합니다. Thank you so much for joining us to make this exciting announcement, Governor Yang. I'd also like to end by again thanking our panelists, Climate Group and the COP Presidency for joining us today. East Asia has huge unrealized renewables potential with the whole continent representing a big investment opportunity through to 2030. But that investment opportunity won't materialize unless all the players in the system work together to make it happen. We've heard today that business is ready to step up as are many subnational governments and our speakers demonstrate what can be done when business organizes to drive change. I hope they can be an inspiration to others and beyond the region. But clearly, we have a big transformation ahead of us. The private sector can be the engine of change, but there is also a lot of responsibility on government's shoulders to design the regulation and market incentives to enable investment to flow. But it's exciting to hear that the political will is growing to get there. Thank you very much for joining.